Um, so hi, my name is Elena Loomis and I am a member of the Monterey County Democratic Central Committee. I am one of the two vice chairs and our other vice chair is just now walking in and we'll do some a couple of quick introductions of folks that are here. Um, so we got together, I'm the chair of the campaign committee and we decided that we really wanted to reach out to possible new faces who might be interested in running and people who've run before but might be a little refresher or just get some new ideas. And so we are hosting this event, we're calling it Winning Ways because you know, all of you will run and then win, of course. Um, and so we put together a panel. Our first group of panelists are folks who are elected officials and they'll each get an opportunity to address a few questions and we'll allow time for questions after that point. And then um, we have one person who is a campaign manager, what's the title? Campaign consultant. Campaign consultant. Um, our second person who is going to speak as a campaign consultant, Valerie Guardiola, uh, has uh, fallen ill, you know, a cold. It's not serious, but anyway, she didn't feel like she was up to coming and didn't want to expose the rest of us. So when Adam speaks for the second half, he's going to be a solo show. <laughs> um, so with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. And before I introduce the panelists, um, I'd like to introduce Karen Araujo, our other Monterey County Democratic Central Committee for Assembly District Vice Chair. Yes. And um, our committee members who are in here, Amit Pandya, who's also on the Central Committee, and Tyler Williamson, and Natalia Molina, mm -hmm. and who else is on the committee? The, oh, David Hong, <laughs> and David Burnett. Anthony. And, Anthony. Oh, and Anthony's also on the central committee. And then Holly Carlin is out doing registration. So I think I got all that folks that are on the committee. So thank, thank you to the, our committee members. So our panelists include uh, Luis Alejo, who's District Supervisor 1, and Neil Patel, who is on the school board for Santa Rita, and Kayla Jones, who is um, the newest city council member in Seaside, and Alan Hoppe, who is a city council member in Monterey. And I'll let them give you a brief little biography, and then we're going to address some of these questions. And um, Tyler, could you help me with time and signal me when it's quarter to about approximately quarter to 11 so that we can do Q&A at that point? Thank you. So, I want to start just give us a little, just a little brief bio, and then we'll, we'll do the questions after that. Yeah, well, thank you everybody for coming this morning. I'm uh, Supervisor Luis Alejo. I'm a former state assembly member. I, I was turned out last year. I served six years in Sacramento. Prior to that, I was the mayor of my hometown, the city of Watsonville. I was on the council there for only two years before being elected to the state assembly. Uh, now, I'm serving as an honor county board of supervisors in my district. District 1 is most of the city limits of Salinas. Um, but I want to really thank the Democrats for holding this event. Um, and those who are considering running for office, I, I applaud you because I always said, um, outside of teaching and serving in the armed forces, I thought public service in, in, in politics is a great calling where we can make a lot of change. When, long before I was ever in politics, I was a, a young community organizer at the age of 19, and we had started organizing with a group of young people in my hometown after a tragic death of a nine-year-old little girl, Jessica Cortez in Pajaro, and her 16-year-old brother. And we knew that a lot of the violence taking place in our community with other young Latinos killing other young Latinos. So we started organizing around trying to address gang and domestic violence in my community. I started getting involved in voter registration campaigns because Governor Pete Wilson was attacking immigrants back in 1994 with Proposition 187. And that kind of spurred us to uh, organize as, as young people to uh, focus on protecting immigrants and addressing violence. But then it led uh, uh, to addressing affordable housing, quality education, jobs in disadvantaged communities, and it kind of took us there. And when we uh, left to go to college, we all said that one of the greatest problems was that we had a lot of bright young people, but they would go off to college and not very many would come back to their hometowns to lead. So we said we were going to be the, that generation of leaders who were going to go get our education, experience, networks, but one day we were going to come back and use our education to serve our own, young, our own community. And when I came back, I came first to work as a legal aid attorney, using law to help um, poor people solve their legal problems. Um, I got involved in a lot of campaigns. My first 
one of my first committees was the Democratic Central Committee, but it was in Santa Cruz County. And I joined a, a nonprofit board, uh, Salud Para La Gente, to serve on, uh, provide health care services for the most poor residents in our districts. And then I kind of took off from there. But it all started joining the Central Committee. Then I joined the Library Commission in my hometown. I later joined the Planning Commission. And then after working on so many campaigns and serving on various commissions, um, I decided to run for City Council. But part of what I decided to run for City Council, one thing that I learned as a community organizer, because we would mobilize a lot of parents, young people, farm workers, to come speak out at City Council meetings, at school board meetings, supervisor meetings. And after attending a lot of meetings um, and mobilizing a lot of people, after making compelling arguments, presenting good ideas, we learned that unless you have the right people up there making those decisions, you can have a lot of good ideas, but they're never going to get implemented if you don't also have the right people uh, up there. So that's what we decided. We started to start helping progressive Democratic candidates, pro-labor candidates to run for office. And eventually I decided to run for office and my life has taken on um, uh, off ever since then in terms of tr trying to do, continue doing social justice work, community organizing, but doing it in elected office. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Neil Patel. I want to, first of all, thank the Monterey County Democratic Party for hosting this uh, fantastic event. I, I, uh, I see a lot of faces here, and if you're here, then the reason you're here is because you want to make a difference. And that's kind of where I come from a little bit. You know, I'm an immigrant to this country. I come from India. Grew up in Salinas, California. Uh, you know, I was a businessman, developed a couple of uh, small hotels in Mont Salinas, and uh, Later on, moved to LA and uh, worked in uh, corporate finance and banking. But then my uh, older brother passed away, and I had to take his ashes back to India. And while I was there, I did a lot of soul searching. And one of the soul searching things I did was, what is life about? What? How can I make a difference? You know, what is there for us to do? You know, everyone, no one regret, no one sits on their deathbed and says, "Oh, I'm glad I didn't do this or I didn't do that." It's always, "I wish I would have done what I wanted to." I wish I would have made a difference when I had the time. And fortunately for me, that realization came during an unfortunate period of my life. By that time, I decided to give back to my community. Gandhi said it best, do you want to make a difference? You make a difference in your community, where you live, where you work. And that is the best way you can make change in this world that we live in now. And for me, it was participating. I gave up everything and I went to teach. Just like Mr. Lair said, you have to give back. And for me, that was a calling. And I decided to teach in one of the public schools at the time, and that was Alice Hall High School. And I've been there for 16 years. We turned that school completely around. It is now an asset for East Salinas. And subsequently, I uh, started working with the North Salinas. They sat with the uh, New Republic PTA. Got involved there. Then became president. And just then realized that our school district needed some changes. And they needed a little bit more leadership. And I said, well, let me run. And I came to the Monterey County Democratic Party, Monterey County, the Monterey Labor Council, and they were very helpful in terms of getting me uh, up to date on, on the things I need to do, how to register, how to have walking lists, etc. And um, they gave me the support and uh, to go out there and meet my community members, to talk to them, see what they needed. You know, uh, as an elected official, you're a representative, and, I, and it's hard for me because sometimes I have personal desires, but once again, I'm here as a representative of my constituents. And sometimes I make the best decision, and despite them, sometimes people don't agree, but that's okay. You know, if you want to make a difference in the world, you've got to stand up and you've got to say, you know what, I'm willing to do this. Not, not for your ego. You're doing it because you want to make a difference in your community, because you want to leave something behind, positive, rather than doing nothing and leaving whatever left behind for others to do. And so for me, it's a calling. And I, but the fact that you are here, it's a calling. And I hope you give me the support and the, uh, and the little motivation that you might need to get involved. We need you. We need people like you. We need people to come and participate and make a difference. It's not easy, you know? But the point is, what is easy in life? You know that. I mean, you know, we gotta make a difference and stand up. So, you know, in terms of what you can do as an elected official, well, you know what, you can work with others. You can make a difference, you can make progress. You know, you can see the changes. It might take time, but they will happen. But without you, nothing will happen. People have to step up and make a difference. So that's what I'm here for, is to help encourage any and all of you. Please, join us.
You know, we need good people. These towns demand it. They require it. And so the fact that you're here, I just want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. And please uh, participate and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kayla, and um, I'm 24, and I've been involved in the Democratic Party uh, politics since I was 14, so for 10 years. I first got involved um, with the Obama campaign out of the Salinas office um, my freshman year, organizing like youth for Obama, and doing phone banking and sign waving and things like that. Um, and then when I was in Virginia, I also worked on his campaign again in 2012. And then since coming back to the area, I worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign for about seven months. And um, when that was over, I was um, vetted and asked to run. There was a big issue going on in C5, the development project. And uh, I was on the right side of that issue, turns out. <laughs> and um, so I ran um, uh, against that issue, but also really about um, getting families involved in the political process and millennials. And um, I won, and luckily that project went away. I didn't even have to vote on it before I got in the office. Um, but growing up, my family's always been very political, and um, my grandmother worked for Camp Bar, and I have uncles that are um, judges and involved in state assembly. So it was always really normal for me, and I know not a lot of young people have that, and trying to get them involved in politics is pretty hard. So that's my um, focus right now, is mobilizing millennials in Seaside um, to come to our council meetings and advocate for themselves and um, express the need for affordable housing and also making it easier for families to attend our meetings. So um, we now have free child care during our council meetings for parents to, yeah, so uh, for parents to come uh, because that can be a, a big barrier getting involved in your local government if you have to pay $50 to go to a council meeting. So um, that's my focus right now. And um, also on October 17th, I'm hosting a millennial specific town hall at Brown People on Seaside. Um, so I can give anyone more information on that. But if you know any students, or millennials that would come to that, that would be really great. Hi, I'm Alan Hoffa, a Monterey City Council member and chair of the Monterey County Central Democratic Committee. I want to thank you all for being here and thank Elena and her committee for putting this together. Uh, briefly, I've been involved in labor politics for pretty much my whole career. And um, that was sort of my entry into politics, was through my union. And then in 2011, was part of Occupy Monterey Peninsula as we um, expressed our displeasure with what was happening with the economy, income inequality, a failure to rein in the banks, uh, the housing crisis, and all of that. I ran for city council in 2012 and was elected, and then I just ran last year and was reelected. And uh, I'm happy to um, help anyone who is interested, give you my advice. And I'm going to be leaving some cards here if you want to get a hold of me later. Okay. So Lisa has to leave a little bit early. So I'm just going to run through the questions or the topics and let him you know, answer that. And then we can you know, maybe go one by one for the rest of the time. Um, so we should kind of talk about the motivation to run. But um, you want to talk a little bit about any impact it's had on your personal life, any challenges that you might have faced with that regard? Yeah. Um, before I answer that, I just wanted to let people know, when I grew up in these rural communities, um, my hometown, for example, was one of the few cities under the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965 that challenged first um, discriminatory at-large election systems. So in some of these rural towns, you had minority candidates trying to run for office. Wansomo was the, the, the city that set the precedent in the Ninth Circuit Court to challenge at-large elections because it was hard for Latino candidates, uh, men and women who were running for office, but in these at-large elections, sometimes it would basically made it hard uh, for any of those candidates to win. So it got challenged, it struck it down, it implemented district elections in my hometown, one of the first cities to do that on the Central Coast. Um, but as a young person, I learned that in, in, in some of these towns that used to have really conservative politics, they were able to um, um, maintain power doing three things. One, they knew how to foster their candidates. So because the, all the city council members made appointments to boards and commissions, they would put a lot of their friends. So when you had a new candidate who never served, had a chance to serve on a planning commission, a library board, a county commission, it, it made it harder to compete with somebody who had a lot of that experience and a, a well-developed resume. So I think doing that's very important. Second, 
is that then you have fundraise. Of course, a lot of, a lot of the, sometimes a lot of um, uh, these um, conservative communities, they would totally fund their candidates, and somebody who came from a poorer background had a really hard time competing, raising the money to equally challenge and, and have all the research to get their name out, out there. So that's another really important part of it. Learning how to fundraise um, was another critical part. The last part was learning how to campaign, which is uh, science in and of itself. And if you've never done it, when it's time for you to run for office, it becomes a real challenging thing. But there's a science behind precinct walking, getting the right images, to using your campaign, doing the mailer, doing door hangers, and putting your data. You know, so so that's what we also, have, as young people said, we have to learn how to do that as well, become experts at it. And once you learn how to master those three areas, then you can really um, have a better chance of making sure good Democratic race candidates can win. And that's what happened in many of these rural towns. They've changed dramatically over the years because we caught on. But in terms of being in office, to answer the question now, I think it's really rewarding. Uh, it's, um, this job, um, I love it. And it's a job where if you love people and you love meeting, learning new issues and being out in the community, you're going to love it. If you don't like shaking people's hand and, and randomly going to places, it's going to be a, a challenge. But everything's in a balance, right? You have to balance your personal life with your work. And sometimes the work, you get, you get really excited and you get into it. And sometimes uh, you put a lot more time than you probably should. But it's really rewarding. Uh, I've been in politics. This is now my uh, institution of council, six and seven. So this is my ninth year in office. And when I look back at my nine years, and I, and I said, I really came out of community organizing and, and uh, out of legal aid, serving poor people in the legal world. But when I look back at my most rewarding work, um, when I was able to carry a bill to raise the minimum wage for three million people in the state of California, while I was able to offer the bill to give immigrants valid driver's license, this January we're gonna hit a million people. Um, we did the first bill on ethnic studies curriculum out of any state in the country. Um, I led the effort with Senator Ricardo Lara to extend health care to all children in California, 175 <coughs> under Medi-Cal, regardless of immigration status. So when I look back at my eight, nine years in office, and I said, what have you done to make tomorrow better than it is today? What have you done to help improve the lives of other residents in your own community? I mean, that's where it makes it all worthwhile. And just last week, I was at Cesar Chavez Library, and I got a father with his daughter, who just who's, who's disabled. He had a back injury because he was a former strawberry worker. But he wanted just to show me, well, he wanted to tell me the story of his wife who got her driver's license because he can't drive because he's in a lot of pain sometimes, but now he said through the license, now she could drive with a sense of uh, with no fear and, um, and do a lot of the things that many of us take for granted. But he, was, he just came to take a photo to show me the, uh, his, uh, to tell me his wife's story and to show his life was better. And I told him, better than getting any award, any plaque, that's, that's the, the greatest reward that we can get. That's what inspires me, hearing those stories of how you made a difference in somebody's life. So I, I, we had a couple other things we touched on some of them and I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. So understanding your constituencies, your commitment once elected, you really spoke about that, and then resources of money, volunteers, and advice. you want to add anything about understanding your constituencies or you know, anything yes. about Constituents, I, I, I don't know if my other colleagues here on the panel um, are going to talk about this, but as a new candidate, there's a lot of different political circles. And so as a, as a candidate, I want to encourage people like, I, I started out in the Democratic Central Committee, so that's one circle, right? So in this circle of, of the Democratic politics, there's a lot of clubs, there's members of the Central Committee, uh, you get to know all the different elected officials. And so as a new Democratic candidate, I want to encourage people to get to know a lot of the leaders within the Democratic Party. But there's also a labor circle. And there's a lot of different labor unions. You're, uh, this is the mm -hmm. So you got the carpenters here, but there's the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council has about 70 labor unions, and they have a Democrat, they have a, 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 a labor council meeting the first Wednesday every month. So at the beginning, sometimes you could ask to go speak in front of them, but you should go out to, to get to know them. And I always tell people, it's good even before running for office. Go to the Labor Day picnic. Go to the Labor dinner. Go to some of the labor events that they have, because then people will start seeing you and you make relationships, and you start seeing it as an ally within the labor circles. But there's also, in Monterey County, there's a lot of agricultural circles, there's the chamber circles. I mean, so I'm just telling you, uh, now there's a big cannabis circle, you know, a, a whole, a lot of leaders and a new industry in the county. So as candidates, your job is to get to make, make friends in all these different circles, so that as a candidate, you can try to build a coalition behind your campaign. 
you build the broadest coalition that's going to help you fundraise, it's going to help you keep your name out there, but I think it's going to help you really have uh, uh, what you need to win a campaign <coughs> in your community. Okay. And you want to add anything more about resources that a person might need, including money, volunteers, um, advisors? Well, like I said, hire somebody, not hire somebody. On, on, the, on the finance finance side, I mean, that's always the greatest. That's when people ask me, what was the worst part of the job during my time in politics? Fundraising was the most challenging. You've got to force yourself to do it. You know, so um, that means one, you know, um, every candidate at some point you're going to figure out what to do, launch your campaign. When are you going to do your first big fundraiser? And when you set that date, when you set the location. Now we've got a lot of tools to help you get the word out on social media. Uh, we also have to, most importantly, make personal phone calls, send out your emails. But personal contact, those phone calls are more important. And you got to, I always tell people, start with your family, start with your closest friends. But you get 10, 20 donations right there, then you build upon that. Um, but then you have to uh, go through the process with the labor unions, and, and, and hopefully you can get their endorsement, get their support. But, uh, and, and sometimes it's hard because as a new candidate, you don't know a lot of people yet. But that's why, um, um, and, I, and I do it every single year. I gotta go sit down and meet with people, have coffees, um, um, talk one-on-one, -on -one, get to know each other, so that when it's time for you to run, hopefully um, people like you enough that they'll be willing to support your campaign. Um, there's also a lot of other tools on, on, on social media. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, we all used online Act Blue, which was really easy to send out emails and ask people to send a contribution online. Now there's different ways uh, to, to do that. Um, and and overall, I'm, it, people are really uncomfortable getting on the phone and asking people for money. But once you start doing it, and you gotta sit, block off some time, just sit down, go through your phone book, go through your phone list, and, and just call every person. And um, and every ten dollars, every twenty dollars, fifty dollars, hundred dollars you get after a while it adds up. When I first ran for assembly, everyone uh, doubted me because I was I was younger. I was running against a twelve-year council member in, in Salinas. I was from Watsonville. It was a third of the size. Um, but it's a it's a fundraising example because even though I was the underdog, I kept working every little fundraiser. I some, I went out to King City one time and I raised a hundred bucks. It, I said. It's part of uh, I spent more on gas getting there and going back than, than I raised. But, I, but we were hard. Every, every little fundraiser, every time we got invited somewhere, it was $100 there, but it was $500 here, $1,000 there. When the first um, reports came out, because you got to report all your fundraising on these 460s, it gets reported. It ends at December 31st, but it gets reported at the end of January. Um, but when, when the first reports came out, I had double what my primary opponent had. Only because I did that, I was very vigorous. I took every invitation. I, I accepted every, every uh, fundraising opportunity that I, that I had, and I kept working. Even though people thought I was going to get out fundraised, that hard work paid off. And for me, that's a lesson. That even sometimes when people doubt you, as long as you stay focused on what you need to do, and you call all your people, and you do every event that you need to do, raise, raise that money. Um, at the end, that's that's going to be an important measurement because in politics, they always see who's the most viable candidate who has good name ID, who has a good campaign team, but also who's raising that money. It's, it's one of the great, unfortunately, that's just one of the measurements of politics. So if you have money, they know you're gonna be able to have those resources to put out, uh, put out an effective campaign and really put your name out there with the traditional resources on social media, TV, mail, um, phone calling, and of course your, your field team. Um, so I'll just end with that. Okay, great. So um, I think what I'll do is just go one, each question and not everybody has to answer all of it you want to add something so we'll, I'll do it in reverse since Louise ended on campaigning and fundraising and so on would any of the three of you like to add anything to any great techniques that you've had well I guess I'll go all um, so certainly money does matter but one thing I would like to caution you is to, to not let that be an obstacle to running or you know if you've never raised money before it can be very daunting and kind of scary um, so don't let that dissuade you from running if you really feel moved to do so and it is something that you can learn how to do um, but secondly there are other types of resources that matter putting together a good campaign team that will support you is really important and whether they're paid or not, that's a decision you have to make based on how much money you're going to be able to raise. And whether or not you have someone who 
who is willing to work for you because uh, because they believe in you and they don't need to make a to, to make money off of your campaign. If you can find somebody to volunteer, that's great. Um, but so finding a team of people, a campaign manager and a treasurer at a minimum that will that you trust. Number one, they have to be people that you really trust. They have to be people that you can work with, and you have to have clearly defined roles. And then always remember that you, as the as a candidate, are ultimately the one who has to make the final the final decision on things. So that's an important thing. And then also, Louise touched on kind of knowing your constituency, and that becomes part of building your team as well. So yes, encourage you to um, get to know folks in if you're in a labor union, get involved in your labor union. If you're not in a labor union, you can still get to know uh, local labor unions, and the labor council is a great place to start. Um, get to know your, your political party. We may have folks here who aren't Democrats, but if you are a Democrat, a great place to do that would be October 20th at our, at our annual fundraising dinner. We have uh, flyers out there. Um, so, and then within your community, if you're a member of a social group, for example, I'm a member of the Monterey Kiwanis Club, maybe you're in the Alps, maybe you're in some other uh, group, Rotary or whatever, that's also um, a potential part uh, where you can look for folks to maybe support you. Uh, if you have a cause, and you should have a cause, because if you're running, you shouldn't just be running to run, but if there's something you believe in, Going to the group of people who care about that cause, whatever it might happen to be, is another place to kind of build human resources. So there's, there's financial capital, but there's also human capital. These are folks who are going to be able to phone bank for you, uh, deliver your door hangers, um, and help you organize fundraisers and other events. So uh, that, that human support network is also really critical. Um, I'll just add, when you're fundraising, it was really uncomfortable for me um, to go places and pass out an envelope. It just felt really weird. Um, but you just remind people, like, the things that you want to do, the things you want to see in your community, I need your money to be able to do that. <laughs> so that was kind of the, the angle that we took. And um, I didn't raise as much money as my opponent at all. I think uh, I only raised maybe, like, $8,000, and they really outspent me. Um, but I had a huge team of dedicated volunteers that showed up once a week to phone bank and showed up um, Saturday and Sunday all day to walk for me. So that ended up um, being a stronger tool than my opponents that had all the fancy signs and the multiple mailers. But we were actually out there knocking on doors, talking to people, and that meant more. So uh, don't, don't underestimate that. It's not just about money, though you need some. Um, <laughs> But it, the human connection was really, I think, what won my election. Um, just a little bit. Um, you know, start small. You know, sometimes elections can be daunting. You know, when you hear numbers like 5,000, 7,000, 8,000, you know, when you're first starting out, but, you know, it seems to be such a crazy number. But once you get into it, you find these circles that you're a part of, and you encourage them, you let them know your message. And that's a big issue, is you've got to have a message. You got to be there with a purpose, and you have to be able to explain that and deliver that to your constituent. Constituents want support; they want to back things. They want to feel like they were part of the solution. For some, it's part of volunteering. For others, it's giving a certain amount of financial capital. But whatever it is, people are looking for that. And as part of uh, an elected official, is you need to reach out to those people and say, "Here, I am here. We share common beliefs. I need your support." And that is what's called public service. You know, so this idea of fundraising, it was uh, difficult for me initially. But once you start talking to people, you realize in different groups, different organizations, that we all have a common mission, and that is to make a difference in this life. And make a difference. Hopefully, if they align, then you will get the support. And if they don't, they don't. But you need to build a circle <coughs> that you feel comfortable with. Bottom line. And if I could just say, because I got to head out to the other <coughs> government now, last, last two things. Um, 
uh, some people, when they, when they start a campaign, certainly a race for state assembly is very different than a school board or city council race. It just depends. But also people, you don't need to start too big. But if you start with five dedicated family members and friends, we're going to be there with every event you go to. They're going to be there helping you pass out those envelopes, uh, getting to get people's business cards. And then when they start walking, I mean, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have five dedicated, hardcore people who are going to be walking with you all the time than having 20 people who, are, who give you a half an hour. But those are important too. But, but a core team of your closest friends is what you need to really get started. You know? uh, and the other thing I would say is that there's nothing more powerful as, as, uh, as we just said right now, than the candidate walking himself or herself door to door. Um, as you all know, I ran for the supervisor last year. I ran against a 16-year incumbent and an eight-year city council member. I was new to Salinas. I moved to Salinas the year before. But every house, I personally went to every house about three or four times, knocking on the doors. And, and when I would talk to people, I said, have the other candidates come by? You know? And it makes a big difference when you're there. Um, there's some people who are very supportive. There were those who were maybe not so or on the fence, but I would say, well, at least I'm here per in person asking for your support, showing uh, my respect to you uh, by being here personally. And then after the second or third time, then you know you, can, you, you, you pull reluctant people uh, to your side because they, they saw you working it the hardest. So I said sometimes that kind of hard work really pays off. That, that last June, I won that election 50% plus one, which I needed to win, and 16 extra votes. Just 16 more. So it tells you every vote does that. Every little hour or two hours that I was walking, those 16 votes, that saved me a lot of money in the runoff. I probably would have spent another $100,000 in the runoff in June as a supervisor. So I'm telling you, so that, that really matters. So for me, when I tell people, when you're going to run for office, there's nothing more powerful than the candidate already from the beginning. That work is putting your mind. I'm going to be out there knocking on doors. And trust me, I got doors slammed on me. I got people who said nasty things. But I said, thank you very much. May God bless you. <laughs> and, then, and then I just kept going to the next person. So, so once you get in that routine, um, um, and, and you understand that's just the way it is, you'll have a problem. You just keep, keep working at it, get that routine going. And I think that's a, that's a key. It sounds simple, but not too many people do it. But it's a key part of a successful little campaign. Thank you very much, everybody. I got to going. impact on your personal life, your job, your family, knowing your district, and um, I guess we did talk about understanding constituencies, and then the last one, commitment once you were elected. So, anybody want to talk, tackle the impact on your personal life, family? Go ahead. Uh, so, I have a almost four-year-old daughter, and last year while campaigning, I was in school full-time, and then being a mom, and um, I was taking, I think, like 14 units, so that took a lot of energy, um, and it was really, really challenging by the end of the election. I was like, I mean, I want to be on the council, but I'm exhausted right now, so <laughs> I didn't want to take a little break, but um, it, it was the most taxing, demanding thing I've ever had to do running for office. And being in office now, it's definitely easier because I'm not having to spend any free time walking seaside. Um, but I still am in school full time and I still have that four year old. So <laughs> she didn't go away. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's really, it, it's different. And there was no way for me to know what it would be like being in office and there was no way for me to know what it would be like campaigning. Um, but it having a good support system with my family and having people I could call to watch my daughter and my husband was um, incredible the four months we were campaigning. If I didn't have that, then I would not have been able to run or be successful. Um, so if you can, obviously you need to get your family on board first, your partner, whoever is going to be there to answer the phone when you're like exhausted and oh this forum went horribly. <laughs> so that's really important and if you don't have that then um, you're not going to be successful. So. And anything you want, anybody wants to add to that or talk, uh, have a talk much about knowing your specific district or your commitment once you were elected? I'd like to add a little bit to what Kiel has said. Oh, so okay, as far okay. as the as far as like the time commitment goes and how it affects your personal life, 
it is a very big commitment and it, and it will change your life. And she said, right, you need to make sure your family is on board with it. Uh, the camp, during the campaign, the, the time commitment is greater, but you just have to remind yourself it'll end, you know, November 5th, November 6th, or whatever. So that's a limited time period. If you win, then you have an ongoing commitment, and um, depending on the type of office, it can be considerable. Um, and, you know, I probably spend close to 20 hours a week, I would guess, on things related to city council, whether it be, you not, not only do you have your meetings to go to, but you have to prepare for your meetings. You have to meet with city staff or um, the superintendent, if it's a school board. Um, typically, you'll meet with, with the head of the, of, of the um, jurisdiction, maybe once a month or every other week, that kind of thing. Um, you also will be invited to all kinds of events, you know, social events, political events, etc. I think Kayla and I were talking before, I think she's got four events to go to today. I've got two, and there's probably two that I should be going to, but you also need to know, you need to know how to draw limits because you, you can get burned out. So I don't want to, dis again, I don't want to dissuade anyone who might be thinking about running, but at a minimum, I'm guessing you're looking at at least 10 hours a week once you're elected. And during a campaign season, it can almost be a full-time job running, depending on how hard you how hard you're running and how much you want to win. You know, uh, my daddy told me something a long time ago. If it's important, you make the comment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the commitments you have to make is you're probably going to have to reorganize your time and prioritize that. And for some of us it really refines it to a point where you start understanding what is important and what is not. So when I hear Taylor talking about all the judgments you have to do to run for office, I know what's important to her. That's it. I just want to add some things. Once you're in office, though, um, the amount of work you have to do is kind of flexible. So um, I'm only on one committee, but I um, I do a lot of work. I do a lot of work um, going to uh, community events, but I also do town halls pretty frequently. Um, I'm constantly bringing new things forward, so I have to meet with staff a lot. And when you're on the city council, you don't have staff for you, so I have to do all the research myself. I have to make sure what I'm bringing forward is going to be feasible or um, able to be implemented. So you you can. Um, kind of set your schedule to a certain extent. There are some council members, not my, my council, but I know there are some council members that show up to the meeting, they go to their committee assignment meetings, and that's it. So, you know, it's really what, what you want to put in, how many hours you want to add. So we think we'll open it up to questions. Um, if there was anything that we mentioned that we were going to cover that we didn't go into depth on, or just a specific question, and if you want to direct it to one, of the particular panelists, or if you just want to see who wants to answer the question. So, any questions out there? Yes, David. Uh, could each of you talk uh, briefly about the responsibilities you have to these constituents and um, your own personal feeling about how important it is for you to get reelected versus actually accomplishing something? Well, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'll start it off. I think, first of all, you have a responsibility to communicate with your constituents, and that can be uh, a challenge, and that mm -hmm. can be time consuming, but you need to communicate with them, you need to listen to them. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be able to do what a particular constituency wants. You know, you have to, in the end, make a decision that is based on the best information that you have and based on your best judgment about what is in the best interest of the agency you're serving. Um, but So you do need to communicate, you do need to listen, uh, you do, do need to make yourself available, uh, you do need to do the work to be informed and educated on the issues. Um, I guess that would sort of be my first response. Um, so, what was the first question about the constituents? Well, uh, being responsible to your constituents, responsive, I guess, 
and then the mindset that you have, uh, you know, it's important for me to get elected, it's important for me to get re-elected versus am I just doing this to get re-elected or am I, do I still have that fire about the issues and about the reasons why I ran? Right, so being responsive to constituents, um, like I said, I do town halls um, and uh, I buy everyone pizza, so that brings people out um, when there's free food. So yeah, I do the town halls. Um, I am very responsive to emails and phone calls and Facebook messages. Um, I think to date I've responded to pretty much everyone that's ever sent me an email, so that can be a little taxing. But um, as far as worrying about getting reelected, my whole mindset going into this is I will just do the best job I can, and if I'm doing it right, then I'll get reelected. So that hasn't. Um, I, I brought some things forward that were controversial, like when we did the when we passed the sanctuary city resolution at Seaside, that wasn't popular, and I had to convince my other council members. And I knew that because it's a controversial, controversial issue, that that may uh, turn some of the community against me. They may have very emotional um, response to that, but it was the right thing to do, and we did it. And so um, I'm just going to continue doing what I can and doing what I believe in, and I think that people are responding well to that. So I hope I get reflected. Um, I think the best answer to your question is balance. You know, as a representative, you listen to your constituents, you go out there, you meet with them, you listen to their concerns. But often at the meetings, you will have a different group that comes. They voice their concerns. And you have to balance those two things, you know. And the third balance is with you. There are certain things, no matter what my constituent wants, I will not break. Those are your ideals, your virtues, your standards, whatever they may be. You need to stand for something. And not everyone's going to agree. Let me give you an example. We have an issue in Salinas with school resource officers. Two school districts turned it down. When I went with my constituents, overwhelmingly, they were for it, but they wanted a different model. They wanted a more of a community policing. They wanted more of a bridge, more of mentoring. So it was difficult, because at the board meetings, I have other groups that would come that were against it. And so it was a difficult choice. But the truth is, is you know, we need to build bridges. We need to make changes. We need to build better models. If the issue is that police are not working the way they're supposed to or ideally, then let's change that. But we don't get rid of the whole thing. You know, these are our servants. These are our public servants. And in the end run, which is the best? Is it to exclude or to build bridges? And for me, I had to vote yes. And I worked with the other, with the other board members and, you know, we were a unanimous decision. Now, yes, were there people in the community uh, against this vote? Yes. And that is what I have to live with. But the bottom line is, I have to sleep with my conscience, above all else. So this idea of balance is critical. You have to live with yourself at the end of the day. And so I, I think it's a great question, but you know, it, it's individual for everyone. And that's where you have to learn on the job. You know, it's difficult. But it has a great reward. You know, you can make great differences in this, in this life of ours. Other questions? I had a question about mentoring on public speaking and any um, assistance in formulating arguments written and oral. Did anybody have any training? I'm curious on that aspect, but that, that part makes me nervous. Sure. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? So Was there, or do you want to? Um, my question is, did anybody have any formal uh, help training when it comes to public speaking and formulating their arguments in a way that's written and oral. So how do you how do you have your ideas and your passions and able to formulate them in a convincing way and articulate them to different communities, constituents, parties? So I'm curious if anybody had any formal um, and how how that went. <laughs> So I didn't have any like formal training. I, I mean, I took public speaking in college. That was a required class, so I kind of already knew how to do that. But um, college was a long time. Ago. <laughs> 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 well, the people that I uh, was running against, though, they could. I mean, their experience public speaking was being in office and campaigning. But prior to that, I know that they didn't do any like public speaking classes or anything like that. 
that. So, I mean, I, I did take that class, which helped a lot with like delivery and um, knowing like the rhythm of your speaking, don't speak too fast, things like that, how to reach people. But um, I just want to say, as a woman, uh, women a lot of times um, uh, are, are more reserved and more self conscious and think that they can't go up against men or that their ideas aren't strong enough. And I found that to be completely false. They definitely underestimate us. And that is to our benefit, <laughs> like 99% of the time. So um, I didn't receive any training, but whenever I did write down my arguments or practice them, I had a, I had at least three people that I could practice with, and they'd say, "You should tweak this," or "That's that doesn't really come across well," or um, "This is this could be more articulate." So if you have people that you can kind of, and they, they weren't like speaking coaches, they were just friends and family. So if you have people that you can practice on, that helps a lot. Um, but don't feel like you need training or anything like that. And, and I would say that, you know, it depends. You need to do kind of a self-analysis. Mm -hmm. I actually did a SWOT analysis before I ran my first campaign to figure out what were my strengths, what were my weaknesses, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, if speaking is a strength, then that's not something. But if you feel like it is a weakness, then in putting together your campaign team, make sure that you have somebody there who has good communication skills as you put together your initial kind of um, platform and you're developing your issues and how you describe those issues, you can bounce those ideas off of your campaign team. You're hopefully your campaign manager, maybe you have a communications director. So it's not just you. And then in my case, before I would go to debates, I would meet with some of my key team members and we would try to anticipate debate questions and prepare um, prepare answers so it wouldn't be a complete surprise. So practice and um, and having good advisors can really help make you more comfortable. I, I, I think Alan said it probably best. The two things is having people around you and you have to be able to take criticism and feedback from your closest friends and your team. If you cannot get it from them, then God knows where you will. Those have to be the people you trust. The other is practice, practice, practice. Before I ran, I was on the PTA year after year, speaking in front of parents, speaking in front of teachers, and it builds, you build courage. And that's the, what I think of as one problem, is you're building courage each and every step of the way. You know, you have some success, and step, you know, some setbacks, but it doesn't matter, you keep pushing forward, and as you grow, your confidence will grow. I don't think anyone running for office the first time is very courageous in terms of, well, I'm gonna do this, and it's gonna be awesome. You know, everyone has a sense of, hey, you know, this is going to be a learning curve for me, and I need to trust the process, trust the experts. You have great people around you, Democratic Party, and labor unions, you know, and go to them, get advice, seek advice, you know, and consult. But ultimately, you're going to have to do it. So you've got to build that courage step by step by step. You know, it's not something that's happening overnight. Okay. Um, We'll go, we'll, I'll take the, there were three hands out that Timothy was first. And I just want to thank and recognize that Timothy Barrett is a Monterey County, or uh, Monterey City Council member as well. And he had his hand up first. Just to make the comment that judging by the way the question is articulated, um, this, this person right here has no problem with communication. <laughs> and it may simply be a matter of building that courage, which is what was alluded to, uh, wrapping that message, which is refined that way. I want to check them out now. Toastmasters is a great, uh, is, is really a great way of, of getting out there and practicing with other people. Um, years and years ago, I, I, I uh, was involved with Toastmasters and it really helped. But I don't know how to speak. You know, another thing that really helps is if there are speakers out there that you really um, appreciate, like one of my favorite speakers is Obama. And what, why I enjoy his speaking is because he'll say, I have three points. Point number one, point number two, point number three. The other thing you can consider is go to city council meetings, speak on something you feel passionately about at public comment. When you have that discipline to speak within those three minutes, that that's amazing. And, just, and for, and I, speaking of women, we need to learn to project our voice. When I speak here, I, I'm speaking to you from from here. A lot of a lot of women speak from up here. And you can be more commanding when you're speaking from your diaphragm. But practicing at city council meetings, public comment, three minutes—that's 
That has helped me. Great suggestions, Postmaster. And one, I think we have one last question. Yes. And it's more directed to something um, Alan said. And, and you were talking about the campaign and the manager and the treasurer. And you said it's important to have clearly defined roles. What What is the outcome if you don't have such clearly defined roles? I, I, don't, I don't understand what that could be. Well, if, if, if you don't have clearly defined roles, then somebody might step on somebody else's toes in your, on your team. You want everybody to be working together. You don't want somebody you know, doing something that you didn't, re you don't want them doing, basically. You define the roles. This person is going to handle making your printed materials. This person is going to be handling money. You know, they're going to be taking the money, depositing it, spending it, etc. This person is going to be helping you with putting together your 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 um, door door list, your door knocking list, or whatever. But um, you want you want. Sometimes you can get into situations where there can be conflict within a campaign itself, and that's not good. And I think often that happens when people don't know their roles. One other, one other thing, there is a considerable amount of record keeping and reporting that's required when you know, someone is delegated for those roles. Uh, the requirements can kind of get lost. Right? Um, I want to. Uh, Mr. Patel, I wanted to ask you something. Something you said was, you know, you had to have a conscience and, and, and really when it comes to, you know, the issues and, and different platforms around you, but it, I think at the end of the day, what you truly believe is what you're going to uh, promote. You know, there's a lot of controversy right now and um, forward thinking and backward thinking in the cannabis industry. And, um, and you know, years ago, uh, President Nixon put the war on drugs to a, a, a plant that had been used medicinally for, you know, generations and years. And, and, you know, now people are evolving and understanding that this is truly medicine. This is truly helping people. And, you know, but there's two sides of the, um, of the platform of, you know, no, this is really heroin, and no, this is medicine. I'd like to ask all of you, what, what, what is your take on this, and do you believe that we're going to be able to make change? Because not only that change is bringing about um, social consciousness, but it's also bringing money to communities that are in a dire need, like South County. Okay, um, I'm going to just say that I think that question is not really relevant for this particular forum. That sounds more like you're asking a question about a candidate's stance on an issue. And we really invited folks here to find out how to run a campaign, how to campaign, and the impact. So if you don't mind, if you have a particular candidate that you want to ask that question to, maybe you could do it offline. If you, if you don't see, I just feel like that's not where we're headed okay, on I'm a sorry. particular I'm issue. Glad to but, talk with you. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, okay. I, just, I was just talking about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you want a general question about how people make a decision about a moral issue, then how about that? Address that. How about that? that? Okay. Or well, what, what I, have to, I, I can address it from that point of view. So uh, we were Monterey City Council. We were faced with this issue, and uh, for me, part of the reason that I supported um, allowing medicinal marijuana dispensary in the city, which we lost that vote, Tuki and I both supported it, but we lost that vote. Part of the rush, part of my thinking had to do with just the people's health. And you've got people who need that as a medicine and uh, don't have access to it. But so looking at um, looking at things from how is this actually going to, issues from how is this actually going to affect people is, is part of the calculus that I go through when I'm looking. How is this going to really affect people? And in this case, not being able to get um, the proper medicine just seems it won't. Great. Anybody else want to address it from that point of view? Or? Yeah. Um, oh. It's a difficult issue. I think you know it's a lot of controversy. It's an evolving issue. I will say this. Um, I am for decriminalizing those drug offenses, which is overwhelming our penal code. We have the most number of uh, people in jail per capita than any other nation on the 
face of this earth. And the idea that we are criminalizing rather than rehabilitating and providing solutions, and rather than just closing the door and pretending it doesn't exist, that is not what we're doing. And so that's what my effect on this, is that we need to find solutions that are productive and that can work and decrease the criminalization and reduce our uh, funding of our penal system. Well, thank you, so you got your question answered. I know. I apologize. But as somebody who would go to politics, I would wonder, you know, like you said, at the end of the day, what does my conscience say? As I don't believe. As an educator, I cannot see how we as society can justify paying seven to ten thousand dollars for a student to be educated, and yet we're going to spend forty to fifty to sixty thousand on a person being in jail for a year. I find that horrendous. Yeah. So you're in the library oh, to talk about issues too. I have a question about the the physicians. Is there anywhere a job description and prerequisites of what people should take when they go ahead to apply for an office of any of the I mean I'm looking at the list, but I'm wondering what exactly do these people do? It would be really nice somewhere to have a job description and see if you're even qualified to run. Well, I mean, technically, the way our system works is if you're a citizen, you're qualified to run. I know. That's not the problem. Maybe it would make sense, and maybe our campaign committee could look yeah. at that. There are, there are sort of different roles of, of scope of responsibility. So having been on the school board once and now being on the city council, they are, there are slightly different responsibilities. Uh, scope of responsibility. So yeah, maybe that is something that our yeah. campaign committee could look good at. Idea. That very would be great. Good. And I, our intention, I think, it would be to um, mm -hmm. make some resources available online. And we also have a plan to hold three, or maybe maybe the, your idea could be a fourth one, um, more intensive workshops that are topical. And so perhaps one of them could just be the actual roles on a. a whether it's city council or supervisor, because obviously the time commitment varies, the amount of research you have to do, like Kayla was talking about doing it on your own. So I think that's a great point. Not to say that it's a you have to be qualified to do this, but you should at least be know. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have coffee. Yeah. So you want to wrap it up in one minute. Oh, one last, okay. One yeah, last I just question. wanted to say, you know, there are some boards uh, where some technical background would be helpful. City Council knowledge of, uh, you know, Robert's Rules or State, the, 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 the city's charter is important. But the most important, I think, qualification is that you want to do the job for the people. Okay, so it's not about your techniques of speaking or, you know, how you sit at the dais or anything like that. It's yeah. that you want to serve the people. And if that's not your motivation, don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Support somebody who wants good, to do it. Good way to end, I think. Um, let's give our Give a little biography, and then he's going to talk more about the, some of the integrity about running a campaign. Um, okay, go ahead. So hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pintedits. Um, I'm a campaign consultant, and I've been working in political campaigns uh, for you know, since 2006. Um, I got started initially here locally going to college at CSU Monterey Bay, and I was president of the College Democrats. 
that led me on to participate as a member of the Central Committee and later and then working on various campaigns, um, including uh, the Obama campaign, Senator Bill Monning's campaign, and uh, most recently the uh, campaign for Ana Caballero for Assembly last year. Um, so with uh, over two dozen campaigns uh, that I've worked on, uh, I wanted to come here and share with all of you some of the nuts and bolts and what to expect uh, of running a campaign uh, and what that may mean for all of you next year or in the years to come. Um, so I'm going to try and get through a lot of material, to, um, as, including what the other panelists are supposed to cover. Um, and I'm going to try and get through that quickly enough to have plenty of time for questions, since imagine if you're planning on running for office and you've never run a campaign before, you'll probably have a lot of those. Um, so first and foremost, uh, and before I dive into my talking points, I want to touch on something that the other panelists have said, um, which is that each one of them told a bit of a personal story. And that's essential as a candidate to have a story, because one of the first questions you'll often be asked is, why are you running? What inspired you to run? What's your motivation? Um, before they even ask you why you think you're qualified, they usually ask you that. Um, and it's important to have that narrative and not just say, oh, because I want to be in public office or I want to give back. I mean, sure, that's an answer. But to have a compelling answer and an answer that serves your campaign's purposes, you want to create a narrative. Um, so for Luis, that was you know working, that was community organizing, um, and and and, all, and or for for you, Jim, sir, it was uh, you know kind of that moment uh, with your brother and and really thinking through things, and that's important, right? Telling people that I imagine you told people that on your campaign too, right? And that's because when you tell people your story, then you become more than just a name and more than just a candidate. You become someone that people can relate to that people can find personable, and that's ultimately what wins votes more than, than any sort of, oh, I have this intelligent uh, opinion on this position. Yes, it's important to be knowledgeable about the issues, but to be candid, the average voter isn't going to know all the nuances of all these issues. They're going to want someone they can trust. It's an emotional decision. Um, and I've met a lot of candidates who feel like, but I've got the best platform, and I'm the smartest candidate. And I'm sorry, that that's a, those are good things to have in, you know, on your side, but they don't matter. Voting is a largely emotional decision. Now, there are a few voters who vote purely based on very technical policy-based things, but that's a minority of voters. Um, so the first thing you're going to want to do is form your campaign committee, and that, some, several panelists already covered that. Um, who do you need? You need friends who keep it real, who will be honest with you even when you disagree with them. Uh, past office holders are great if you know any of those. Doesn't need to be specifically for the office you're running for, but anybody else on your campaign committee who's, who will volunteer to help you think through the process is great. Um, and just level-headed professionals in general. Uh, anyone who's well-organized, who you can work with, as other panelists have said. Um, you know, think about who's the, who's the most meticulous record keeper you know in your personal circle. And who is the most dynamic speaker and sort of the most charismatic person you know? You'll probably want them to help inspire your volunteers and organize them, um, etc. cetera. Um, who don't you need? Because that's important too. <laughs> you don't need friends and family who will always agree with you. And I've seen way too many campaign committees with at least one of those types of people. And while it's nice to have someone there that you can really trust, if they're going to just agree with everything you say, then they're really not doing you any service. And, and if anything, you might end up, you might have an idea in your head that you think sounds great and they agree with you, and so the committee moves forward with that, and the dissenting opinions were, were you know, forgotten, and guess what? You find out that that was the wrong decision to make because you didn't, you had too much of an echo chamber uh, and not enough competing ideas to really refine that and make it the best that it could be. Um, how big should the campaign committee be? I'm not going to say that there's an arbitrary magical number. I would say you want somewhere between four to eight people. If you get more than that, then it's too many cooks in the kitchen. If you have fewer than that, then you're probably just doing yourself a disservice by leaving out some, some good people to contribute. Um, one of the most important campaign positions is going to be your secretary. Someone who's going to keep things organized, who's going to make sure that you don't drop the ball on something, who's going to keep track of deadlines sort of be the overseer of the campaign calendar, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, so someone good, who's good at tracking details, deadlines, and records. And that's going to be important for, you know, gee, filing. Uh, I remember that about uh, three or four years ago, there was someone running for uh, Salina City Council who missed the filing date. Well, <laughs> shit, have a luck. <laughs> um, so um, 
the second most uh, and arguably equally most important uh, com campaign committee position is your treasurer. It's going to be the person managing your money. It's effectively your accountant and your controller at the same time. So if you have someone who's an accountant who's willing to do it for you, that's probably a really good start. Um, but really someone who's just good at bookkeeping and reporting, um, and especially that reporting part that I was alluded to in the last session with the other panelists. If you miss a reporting deadline, you're in trouble. And I know some people who are literally thousands of dollars in debt to the state because, whoops, they reported something wrong years ago when they ran for office and it catches up to them just like the IRS does. Um, so don't do that. Get a good secretary and a good treasurer, keep track of your deadlines, and submit everything on time. Uh, other members that are good to have on your campaign committee, if you have good event organizers, people who are very dynamic, very social, have a very broad personal network, that's a great person to have. Uh, volunteer motivators, someone who is really good at inspiring people and getting people motivated to act. Uh, you know, when you're asking people to donate two to four hours of their time every single weekend for a month or two months, you, you know, that, that's a bit of a hard ask. You're going to need someone who can convince them why that's worthwhile doing and, and keep them motivated. Um, people with extensive political experience and, and community networks are great. My one caution with that is don't allow somebody to be on your campaign committee if they're there with their own agenda, right? They should be there for you, not to try and advance their own agenda. Um, but, uh, but as long as their expertise can be applied to your benefit and your campaign, great to have them. Um, roles to play, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was mentioned earlier that you don't want your campaign committee stepping on each other's toes. Um, it's very important that people stay in their lane. Uh, not to say that people aren't going to collaborate and help each other, right? Obviously, if you've got somebody heading up your fundraising events, they're going to need to work closely with the treasurer to make that all work smoothly. Um, but set your expectations, both with yourself and with your campaign committees early on, to make sure everybody knows this is what I'm responsible for. Everything else, unless I'm asked, you know, leave it alone. Um, so do uh, allow candid and constructive dialogue. Delegate projects, because you can't do it all yourself. And uh, create a shared online workspace, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what you should not do is allow backseat driving on any particular project or event or anything. Uh, if somebody has input, then they need to be prepared to implement that input. Um, do not try to do it all yourself. You cannot, trust me. Uh, you know, maybe uh, it depends on the scope of the race. If you're running for mayor or county supervisor, there is absolutely no way you're going to do anywhere near everything for yourself. I've seen people who successfully do everything themselves, running for city council or school board or other other positions like that. Um, but I, I think you know they would probably agree it's it's pretty hard. Um, And uh, do not every keep everything on the computer, and even worse, please do not put every keep everything on paper. Um, I, I, I've worked with candidates who are still working on a paper calendar, and I understand that they, that may be what they are comfortable with, but when a candidate agrees to a couple of meetings at the same time that your event coordinator was planning to hold an event, then you, the candidate suddenly double booked themselves. So don't let it happen if you're a candidate, and if you're a committee member working with a candidate, don't let them let it happen. <laughs> um, so there are many great software packages out there, many great tools online and otherwise. I'm not going to advocate for any particular one. I am just going to mention um, that Google does kind of provide everything in a free package that's fairly easy to use and that's shared. So by all means, if you prefer Dropbox or Slack or any of the other dozens and hundreds of tools out there, go ahead, use what works best for you. Um, but I'm going to talk specifically about the features of Google, uh, of Google because it kind of has everything in one free package. And that is that you need a shared document workspace, you need spreadsheets to be able to track your endorsements, your volunteers, your donations, and you need multiple people to have access to those spreadsheets at all times. And it cannot be on one computer because what happens if that computer you know, goes broke or whatever, right? You lose it. Um, you need a shared calendar. Again, I just mentioned why. And uh, so Google Calendar is great because you have shared access. Everyone can see, oh, there's an event on this time. Or there isn't an event, but we've blocked it off as a potential event date. So I'm not going to you know, add an endorsement interview onto that date because that's just not going to work. Um, and that way, if everybody, if the calendar is synced up automatically to your phones, to your computers, that's going to really cut back on your scheduling issues uh, and, and prevent some crazy day where you're running around to 10 different events. Um, it also helps to have a Google Voice number. 
and set up a campaign line that is attached to that. The reasons being, multiple people can answer a Google Voice number. They can also, multiple people can access the voice messages left to it. The messages get transcribed into text. Um, so that's a, a great tool to make sure that co campaign correspondence works smoothly because what happens if you receive a phone call, say, for uh, an endorsement interview or a, a news media interview, and they're on a deadline, but you're busy because you're already in some other events, you know, maybe you're uh, you know, walking door to door and so you don't catch the call, you need somebody else to be able to get that call and respond to it in time to take advantage of it. So I guess my message with as far as tools is make sure you have a shared workspace, whatever works for you, have a system where the work can be delegated and shared and uh, everyone's on the same page. Do not rely on paper, do not rely on old school methods. It's, it's simply not effective. You're gonna be running a slower campaign that can't respond adequately to, to what is ultimately a fast-paced process. <coughs> think, of, think of running a campaign as either starting up a small business or a small nonprofit, and you have to make that business profitable in eight months. If any of you have started small businesses, that's, you know, that's not exactly easy. Um, but that's more or less what it comes down to. Um, which brings me to hiring help. Um, so I myself am a campaign consultant. This is what I do professionally. Um, other campaigns also hire an actual staff person. So rather than being on a contractor basis, they actually have an employee for the campaign. Um, key differences in case you don't know, right? If you're a contractor, you effectively can't be told what to do. You can't be trained. You can't be given specific directions. You're given a project, you're given an objective, and you achieve that objective as a consultant. That's what I do. Um, whereas, and I've done this before as well, working as, a, say, a campaign manager, as an employee of the campaign, you're there full time, you're a dedicated, you know, one campaign person, generally speaking, uh, whereas consultants often work on multiple campaigns. Um, and, uh, and your dedicated campaign manager or, or other staff person is also going to be, you're, you're going to be able to work with them, give them feedback, tell them how they need to improve. Whereas legally speaking with a contractor, that's not something you're supposed to do. Um, generally speaking, most campaigns go for, contra go for workers on a contractor basis because it's simpler. You don't have to deal with a payroll tax, um, but uh, it's simpler in HR terms. Um, but that said, it's a, it's a consideration you need to make. Obviously, if you're running for um, you know an office where you know say for many city council races don't raise more than you know fifty thousand dollars or so, it often quite a bit less. Well, then it's not going to be really feasible for you to hire a whole lot of professional help. Um, but uh, if you're running for an office that's frankly needs more voters, right? If you're talking about contacting tens of thousands of voters as opposed to hundreds and maybe a few thousand voters. Right, the scope of work involved at, at those levels is going to demand that you need some help, whether that be from a paid professional or from just a really dynamite team of volunteers. If you can do it all with volunteers, that's great, more power to you. Um, but what you don't want is to be, you know, in the end of September or beginning of October and your election is on November and you're realizing, you know what, with me and my great team of volunteers, I love them, but we just haven't, we've only talked to a couple hundred voters, we, we haven't, we've had a couple events, but we haven't really reached out far enough, and at that point it's too late, right? You don't want to realize that you've done too little too late, because then all the effort that you did put into it has basically gone to waste. I hate saying waste, because it's wonderful that you have those volunteers, they've done a great thing, they might help you again in the next, the next time around, um, but nobody likes to feel like their time is being wasted. Uh, candidates and volunteers alike. Um, so ultimately, I, I just I, I get this question a lot, right? Do I need paid campaign help? And the only 100% answer I can give any of you without actually assessing your individual campaign and knowing what the details of it are, you only don't need professional help if you're running on a pose. I can say that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, you need to make a consideration. Do I, do I have an opposition? How well supported are they? How well funded are they? Or how well supported and funded are they likely to be? Um, you know, make those assessments like a straight uh, SWOT analysis and determine is the threat high enough that I, that I need help. Um, now I'm going to get a little bit into fundraising and reporting. Um, and you know, so, something I heard from the previous panelists and that I've heard from, from clients of mine is, is this kind of fear around fundraising. I had, I had one um, prospective client ask me, am I going to have to take out a second mortgage? if fundraising doesn't work out well and, and you're giving me your bill. 
And I said, well, okay, you're, you're, you're making this really personal and I can understand that and I appreciate your level of concern and precaution for that. Um, but I don't like to think of fundraising a, a, and, and, and as uh, campaign financing as something that you should think of as, oh, this is my personal financial burden. Can it be? Yes, absolutely. But you want to avoid that scenario altogether. You want to have a robust enough fundraising plan to make sure that you have enough money to pay for everything you need to do to win. And that fundraising can be done all externally. I've seen campaigns where the candidate literally didn't donate a, a single time to their own campaign, and that looks bad, so don't do that. Do, do donate a bit to your own campaign, but um, the point is, this does not have to be a burden that's all on you. It does not have to be this great source of fear or apprehension about campaigning. Uh, as has been said previously, do not let money be a barrier to campaigning. Campaigns can be run entirely grassroots. It's just a lot of work. Um, but you are, as some of the panel, previous panel, uh, panelists said, you are going to have to ask for at least some funds and you're going to need to get comfortable with asking for money. And if it's personally something that's difficult for you, and it is for a lot of candidates, every candidate I've ever worked with, they all hate what's called call time, which is when the candidate sits down and calls their list of people and asks for money. They all hate it, trust me. Um, so don't, but don't think of it as this personal solicitation, like you're begging for money from these people. Think of it as, I'm asking you to donate to my campaign as an investment in the leadership of our community, right? Phrase it as, this is a cause. This isn't just me as an individual. It's not about my ego and funding my campaign. It's about funding our campaign for a better future for our community. And once you frame it in those terms, A, you're going to get more donations or higher level amounts of donation, uh, and B, you're going to feel a little bit less personally attached to it. It's going to be a little less embarrassing and awkward for you to be asking for that money. But you will need to ask for money. Um, as the previous uh, panelist said, you will need to do it by phone. I've seen some candidates who insist that they only want to do it with letters. And solicitation letters for fundraising are great. But if you're relying solely on them, I can tell you right now, your campaign will probably be broke. And I know because past campaigns of mine have been broke when that's all we did. Um, so basically, when it comes to asking for money as a candidate, Get over it. And, uh, and also, you as a candidate, and this has been shown through, throughout campaigns beyond just the one that I've worked with, but any campaign fundraising expert will tell you, the best solicitor of funds is the candidate, because then it's a direct ask for the person running for office. I've met candidates who decide, oh, I'm going to host a fundraising event, and uh, I have this great fundraising host who has a lot of friends with a lot of big money. I'm going to have them ask for money on my behalf. And that can work pretty well. But again, if you rely solely on other people or solely on that one tactic, your campaign is going to be broke. Um, so direct solicitation is how most campaigns begin their fundraising. That's how you get your you know, initial startup money, is just by tapping your own network and asking them for it. Um, but then you want to take some of that pressure off and delegate some of the fundraising work to your volunteers or your, or your campaign professionals. Uh, and that's where events really come in, right? You can get a lot, you, you, can, you need to ask for the money yourself in a direct solicitation. But when you're organizing a fundraising event, that's when you can begin delegating a lot of the work to the people who are helping you out. Um, always make sure that your fundraising events is profitable. I've had fundraising events where, hey, we raised $1,200, but we spent 1100 on the fundraiser. Yeah, not, not very, you know, kind of a waste of time, right? So um, one of my suggestions for that is make sure that every event, fundraising event you have, that you have a host and that the host, instead of don't, maybe instead of or in addition to donating money themselves, that they are donating the costs of the event. That's an in-kind donation. It still needs to be taken down as a donation, as an in-kind donation. You still have to report that. Um, but that minimizes a lot of the risk, right? So that way, okay, this fundraiser only, you know, it cost $500 to put on this fundraiser, we only raised $800, so it wasn't that successful, it was hugely successful. But we raised a little bit, and ultimately the risk was all on the host of the fundraiser. And that's very kind, kind and generous of them, of course. But at least that way the campaign is not suffering when a fundraiser doesn't go exactly as planned. Um, endorsements and organized-based donations. Uh, you're going to need uh, to keep track of all the endorsement deadlines for every organization, the Democrats, Labor, um, any other kind of group that you can imagine. A lot of nonprofits don't want to get into doing endorsements, and you need to respect that. 
Um, but you're going to want to go out there and get as many endorsements as you can from as many groups and organizations as you can. With the one caveat that, you know, if you're running in, on a, let's say, hypothetically on a platform of education and school bonds, right, and you're, you know, part of your platform campaign is we need to fix our schools, we need to raise some more bond money, well, the chances are that Jarvis tax, our, our taxpayer group is not, you know, the place to go for an endorsement. So just be cognizant of, of political alignment uh, when you're asking for your endorsements. But generally speaking, it's a good idea to, even if you're not perfectly aligned with a group that you're asking endorsement from, it's still good to submit the endorsement application and, and answer their questions and ask for their endorsement. If nothing else, even if you don't get it, just to pay your respects and to show that, hey, I would like your endorsement. Even if you don't give it to me, I respect that decision. I would still hope for your, your members' support, right? Um, ongoing and online donation um, opportunities. Uh, it's important in this day and age to have an online donation portal. If you're only accepting donations by cash and check, you're limiting yourself. Um, so it's great to have that set up. It is at this point a, a requirement. Um, and uh, in addition to having email blasts and email solicitations, um, you can also add to that a letter writing campaign as a supplemental fundraising tactic. Um, and that's going to give you a trickle of cash on an ongoing basis. But don't expect it to fund your entire campaign because it won't. Um, reporting and knowing your deadlines. This is going to come down to your secretary. Your secretary is going to need to know the Monterey County Elections Office website very well and know the FPPC website very well. That's the Fair Political Practices Commission. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the FPPC. They have officers specifically assigned to answer questions about reporting. It's in their interest as well as yours not to have any kind of audit issues later on. They don't want to do the work, but they will, and they'll do it just like the IRS does. I'm sorry, the Fair Political Practices Commission, the state uh, state agency. Um, so their requirements are all detailed uh, online. They have uh, documents available on their website that will give you all of the deadlines, all of the requirements. I wouldn't call them step-by-step -step instructions, but they do try and help make uh, reporting as accessible as possible, which is important, especially for first-time candidates. Since you're not familiar with the process, Make sure you and your secretary and your treasurer are deeply familiar with the process of reporting. Because like I said, you do not want to screw that up and end up with some kind of penalties or fees that accrue interest and all that. Uh, not to mention it doesn't look great in the paper if you're you know, <laughs> under audit by the FPPC. Um, uh, platforms and issues. Um, so know your constituents, not just your network. I'm glad the other panelists touched on this. Um, engage with all local groups, not just the ones that you like. Of course, you still should engage with the ones that you like, but you know, get to know people that are outside of your comfort zone, outside of your circle, um, because ultimately your circle by itself, I guarantee, is not big enough to get you elected. Um, know the news and current events. Um, I recommend anyone considering running for public office, even if you're looking at a November election and, and we are here in October now, set up a Google alert, several Google News alerts. Make sure that any news article that relates to the office you're interested in, or the, uh, or the region that you're interested in, uh, or the names of some of the potential opponents or the potential incumbents, right? You can set up a Google alert with all these keywords, so that the moment any article about those subjects or keywords pops up, you get an email saying, oh, hey, here's this article. And you know, it might be that you only get an, an, a Google news alert once a week or once a month, but the fact is, the moment that news is published, that you get alert about it so that you're never caught in an embarrassing situation where someone says, what do you think about such and such, this and this article that was published yesterday? Well, I, I don't know, I haven't read it. Right, you should always be up to date if you can be. Um, sign up for various organization newsletters to get their take on the issues. So the Democratic Party, Labor, Central Labor Council, any other groups, particularly the ones that you feel aligned with since their newsletters are gonna tell you you know, oh, if I'm aligned with them, then I'm going to, you know, probably see things from their perspective. But at the same time, it's probably also helpful to sign up for some newsletters from organizations that you might disagree with or not always agree with, because then you're going to get the other sides of the issue. And that's important to be aware of, too. Not only once you're, once you're an elected official, you have to know that, because you're there to represent all the people. 
But even as a candidate, you want to know what, that's, what, what uh, your opposition's perspective is. Because the better you have an understanding of it, the better you can try and build some bridges and maybe get some crossover support. Uh, research the history of controversial issues, not just what's been said most recently. Um, so, for example, Kayla uh, mentioned that she, uh, you know, campaigned heavily on a develop on a local development issue, uh, and that issue spanned the better part of over a decade. Uh, and and I know that she did her research; she knew what she was talking about, um, and that was to her credit. Um, uh, and know yourself, right? And this goes back to the uh, integrity part, right? You you've got to get to sleep at night. Uh, so don't take up a position that, that, that you really cannot actually support. Um, you don't want to claim an issue either just because it's popular, right? So, you know, if, if there's a real hot button issue but you don't feel especially passionate about it, then claiming to really care is going to ultimately appear disingenuine to at least some of the people. They, voters will see when you're just half-heartedly, oh, yeah, I really believe in gun rights personally do, folks, but <laughs> I'm just saying, if your heart's not in it, people will tell. Um, think and talk through how the issue fits into your values and background, bounce that around with your campaign committee, and then develop a unique narrative that fits the issue into your candidacy and platform. Perhaps an issue that everybody else sees as us versus them can present an opportunity for you to find some common ground or even find an alternative that neither side had considered before. Um, so don't limit yourself to binary thinking. Be able to think outside of the box and, and consider how can I be an innovative candidate, an innovative leader, and present new ideas. Um, so authentic messages get through to people. Fake crap doesn't stick for very long. Just remember that. Um, you will campaign best for issues you truly believe in and are passionate about. Uh, know your role in the office you are seeking. So avoid taking really strong positions on issues that don't affect your office, right? If you're running for water board, you might feel really passionately that black lives matter, but you know what? It's not really in the purview of duties in the office that you're seeking, and you might just be turning away voters who would otherwise vote for you because you're taking this politicized stance that you don't necessarily need to take. Now, if you feel really passionate about something, don't censor yourself. But I'm just saying, be cognizant of how would I, th think of it as, if I was elected, if I had already won this election, if I was already in this office, what would my formal response as an office holder be? What would my response be to all of the constituents? And if, and if you think of that hypothetical and your answer is that, oh, you know, really in my elected office capacity, I wouldn't speak to this issue, then maybe don't. Or maybe support somebody else who does. It doesn't need to be you who's vocal on every single issue because you're ultimately just going to create some folks who now have mixed feelings about you. Um, research, re reaching the voters. Um, and this is going to be a scenario of work smart and hard. Um, so, uh, like, uh, like assembly, uh, sorry, assembly member, as Supervisor Alejo mentioned, uh, he knocked on every single door three times. Um, I, I would and not to call him a liar or anything, I don't think he knocked on every door. He knocked on every door of a frequent voter because that's what you do in any smart campaign. If you go literally door to door, then at least half the doors you knock on are gonna be people who either can't vote for one reason or another or who are highly unlikely to vote because they just don't do it, right? You know, our uh, voter turnout in an off-year election like next year tends to be, I think, somewhere around 35% average. In a presidential year, it gets to around 45%. So over half of our eligible voting population doesn't vote, which is really sad. And I, you know, I really wish I had the answer to that one, but I don't. But as a candidate, whether you're a first-time candidate or running for re-election, if you're asking for the vote of somebody who either can't or won't vote, then you're wasting your time. So you, what you need to get is um, you need to establish a win number, and that's going to be based both on what people have, what have office seekers for the same office won by in the past, Take into account off-year versus presidential year. So next year, the turnout's going to be lower than it was last year. Um, and off, generally speaking, office seekers who run uh, in an off-year election in that respect have a little bit less work to do than people who are running in a presidential election because they have to reach more voters in, in order to, to get a majority. Um, get access to voter data. 
like it or not, it's a waste of time and money to be reaching out to the people who don't vote frequently. The Monterey County Elections Department has the voter data available, but there are also software vendors um, who you know pay a little bit more to, but they will organize that data in a fashion where you can create an effective walk list or call list and filter down to the most frequent voters. Um, let's save questions to the end, yeah, thank you. Um, and I am almost done here. Um, get the lay of the land. Are your voters mo mostly in dense residential areas or spread out across rural land? You're not going to be able to go door to door if you know, you're running in a district that is mostly rural voters. It's not going to be effective. You're going to need to do more phone banking. Um, can you estimate how much of your target voter population communicates primarily in Spanish? If, if you know it's a significant number, then you probably shouldn't have a team of volunteers that is all English speakers and no Spanish speakers. That's not going to be very effective. You'll need to try and recruit some volunteers who can communicate to the Spanish speaking voters. Um, or, for example, how many of your voters vote by mail? If, let's say hypothetically, 50% of the people that, you, that you're, whose vote you're trying to earn vote by mail, they're going to get their ballots three or maybe even four weeks ahead of election day. And what you don't want to do is say, okay, so it's October, no, the election's in one month, I'm going to spend every single day in October talking to voters. Well, guess what? You know, by the time you're through with your list, it's half the people that you tried to speak to say, oh, sorry, I, I already turned in my ballot. I never even heard from you before now. Right? So, don't, so know what your list of voters looks like. Don't just, you know, decide, oh, I'm going to pull a list of voters in, in September. Look at it in advance, know who you're trying to reach and how you're going to reach those populations. Um, yeah, I think it's about time to move okay. to questions. So, questions for Adam? I think we have one in the back. What voter software uh, function side do you recommend? Um, I use L2, which is fairly new to the market, um, and as a result, it's a little bit cheaper, um, and not necessarily cheaper in the long run, but what it allows you to do is compartmentalize costs. So you only pay, let's say, oh, I'm going to start out in the early uh, campaign just reaching out to the very highest propensity voters, the ones who vote in every single election. You can buy that list of voters for like, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks, right, or even less, depending on the size of the election you're running for. Um, and that way, that helps you break down the costs over time. So I use L2 for a lot of things, but often for bigger campaigns, right? If I'm running a state assembly campaign or I've worked on congressional campaigns as well, uh, you're gonna need something a bit more robust. Um, and for that, there I recommend PDI, which is the most popular software used in uh, California. Uh, there are other platforms like uh, NGP Van, uh, which is more popular nationwide, but not quite as, much, as good as PDI in California, particularly. Um, and, you know, there are other platforms out there, too, um, but th those are probably some of the top ones. Um, it's pretty daunting as a newcomer, all the people and the roles that are involved in this. Is there a way to share campaign resources or run on slates or something so you're not responsible for all of this? That that, that is a very good question and a great idea. Um, be cautious, and I'm not saying don't do it, because uh, running on a slate of candidates can be very powerful. I've run campaigns where uh, we had multiple candidates for school board that none of them could afford uh, the fees of my colleagues and I on their own, but combined, they were able to, we were able to come to an arrangement where we sort of ran a slate. The thing you have to be careful of is campaign finance laws don't allow for really easy, smooth sharing of resources like that. Because if, if you have a resource and then, let's say, you're lending that resource to another campaign, then that's technically a donation to that campaign, an in-kind donation, but it also brings up questions of, okay, are, are, so are you endorsing together? Are you, you, you know, it, it, it does bring up challenges in terms of, uh, of fair political practices and campaign laws. So it can be done. Uh, what I would recommend is that you do it not necessarily as your campaign in a direct alliance with another campaign, but instead a great model for it is actually the Democratic Party. And I've seen the Monterey Democratic Central Committee put together great slates of candidates where, you know, let's say four or five candidates all earn the party endorsement, and then they can contribute to the party, 
a little bit, right, in modest amounts, and then the party can help pool that money and make a more effective slate effort. So I would recommend doing it in that way. Labor does it a lot too. There will often be a slate of labor candidates. Um, yeah, that, that's the way I recommend going about that. Can I add on to that? So I think another important thing with something like that is that the people have a clear, the candidates all have a clear issue that is really the focal point. So I think there was sort of, I don't know if it was an official slate, but in Seaside, there were a number of candidates who worked cooperatively together, and the main issue was the uh, Monterey Downs project. But so that was a very defining issue in that campaign. It was a defining issue for all of those candidates. They were all on the same page. If it's if lacking that, I think you may find yourself aligned with somebody and then you're at a debate forum and suddenly you hear them saying something that may be quite different from you. So I think that would be a uh, reason for caution as well. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah, it's a political alliance that seems like gold at first may turn sour later on. Um, <laughs> And then, it, and then it can be hard to separate back out and, and um, define yourselves as individual candidates if you've been running together for so long. So I'm not saying don't collaborate, just proceed with caution. And what, can I add one more thing? Okay. So you, there are other ways to do it on a less formal level too, where maybe you're going door, you're, you're delivering door hangers and whatnot. You can <clears throat> offer to deliver some for your colleague if you feel closely and supportive of them and vice versa. That's sort of a less formal arrangement that can help both of you reach more people. Yeah. And that works great with volunteers. If you're paying people to, to deliver door hangers, then be careful because that, again, money and giving uh, from a mo uh, resource of monetary value to another campaign can bring up issues. But yes? And Holly was so our um, treasurer it's... and is an expert on that filing thing. I was the treasurer. I've stepped away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think Elaine is going to go into this in the next section. But if you get the endorsement of the Monterey County Democrats, you will get resources. Um, we make available calling lists, walking lists, um, our slate mailer. So in a sense, that is a shared um, campaign. We, we worked a lot. Kayla ran her campaign out of our headquarters. Um, a lot of volunteers. We had what we call the United Campaign where we, a lot of campaigns supported each other in walking. Um, so that is a shared resources and, and Elena, will, you'll get into that one. Yeah, that's great. But that's perfect. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, what's your take on campaign building websites like Nation Builder? Um, I think they're good for starting out candidates, either Nation Builder or there's also Crowd Pack, which tries to serve a similar function. Um, and they, they can be really good if you're just starting out and if you're you know, a relatively low budget campaign overall. Um, but once you begin really considering running for higher office or if you've got a heavily competitive campaign where you need to really you know, have an edge on your opponents, uh, and, and look as good as you can, then, you're, then you will want to consider uh, a sort of more professional campaign online presence, uh, you know, built by professionals. Okay. Yep. Um, so this last election cycle, a lot of people have never voted before or voted, mm -hmm. and they're not going to come out as high frequency voters if it's their first time voting. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they might vote in this gubernatorial election yes. in response to Trump, you know, yeah. more Democrats voting. So would you say we should focus on the campaign on the fact that those first-time voters and the other part on the voters? Absolutely. I'm glad you bring that up. Um, so when I talk about uh, only contacting frequent voters, there's ways to set up your lists and filters on your voter uh, the database so that you say, I want everybody who's run, who, who's voted, you know, at least three out of the last four elections, but if they've only been registered to vote for the last election and they voted in that one, then they're at 100%, right? You're looking at the ratio at which they vote, not necessarily how long they've been registered to vote, right? If they've, someone's been registered to vote for 30 years, but they've only voted four times in those 30 years, they're probably not gonna vote again, right? So it's, 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 it's not about length of registration, it's about frequency of voting for however long they've been registered. Yeah. In evaluating uh, campaign managers or consultants, mm -hmm. um, 
is their track record or their, um, their overall knowledge most important? You know, it's a combination of both. Um, if, uh, if you're considering a campaign professional who has a lot of lost campaigns on their uh, track record, I wouldn't say dismiss them outright because often the campaigns you lose are the ones you learn a lot more from. Uh, the campaign I probably learned the most from was a campaign I lost. It was a congressional campaign where we contact, where we made over two million voter contacts, and where I worked about 90 hours a week. So don't discount the folks who have lost a couple of elections, um, but at the same time, it, you know, obviously is a bit of a flag. Um, you know, might speak a little bit to their work ethic, but. Get to know them, interview them, talk to them. They should be able to show you if the, you know, both their track record and their experience. They should be able to talk about what they've done in the past, how it worked, how it didn't work, and how it will work for you. Um, so, so, you know, and, and ask them about the local campaign experience. Ask them, have they campaigned here in Monterey County, or are they a consultant from San Francisco who doesn't know, have a clue about this region? Um, so you, do your due diligence is what I'm saying, right? Selecting a campaign professional to help you uh, is, is going to be much like the, you know, running a rigorous job interview process. And could you speak to sort of depending on whether it's a consultant or a campaign manager, what kind of price range should candidates expect based on experience? Obviously it's going to be a range, but yeah. what, what is sort of typical? Um, it's a vast range. It depends a lot on, on the level of office that, that they're working for. Um, you know, the, the pe a, a campaign manager for someone running for assembly or state senate is going to have a, a salary, you know, the, mar the, the going rate for a campaign manager for an assembly race is about a $5,000 a month salary if they're, if they're an employee on your campaign. And then the ch and chances are they're probably working 60, 70 hours a week for you. So it's not that you're not getting your money's worth, but you need to be prepared for the financial commitment. Consultants, you know, can charge quite a bit more than that in some cases, or quite a bit less. I've seen consultants who are very much ideologically motivated, who are trying to do the work because they're passionate about it. I'd like to consider myself one of those, but I also consider myself someone who has experience that's worth paying for. But I try and do my best to, to accommodate candidates who are on a more limited budget. And in some cases, that's going to involve creating a scope of work that's more appropriate. Uh, for example, I've worked on some school board races where, frankly, they didn't need a field campaign. They didn't need a really robust fundraising campaign. All they needed was a mailer and some basic social media stuff. Hey, you know what? 1500 bucks a month or so uh, can usually take care of all of your communications needs and that sort of thing. But it, it, it's going to vary greatly on the scope of work that you're expecting of them and that they're proposing to you, um, and uh, and then you know on their level of experience, right? The, the more experienced uh, political professionals uh, are, are charging professional salaries, and, and that's frankly only fair for the work they do. Uh, and then the key is to select them well, vet them properly, uh, and then hold them accountable to the work that they're committing to do for you. So we're almost out of time and I want to be able to address it. So quick, one last question, comment, and then... So if I'm a new candidate, uh, what are my first steps to get off the ground and actually start running the campaign? Do I hire a campaign manager? Do I... How does this whole thing just begin? So start with your campaign committee. Um, and it, from the campaign committee, get together and establish a timeline for all of the other tasks. It's going to depend a lot on how... Uh, um, contested the election is going to be. If you anticipate running on a pose, then your campaign committee can probably take it pretty easy and just make sure that you get the word out a little bit. If you know that it's going to be a heavily contested election uh, in November, then you should probably hire a campaign professional by January, right? If you're expecting some heavy competition, then it's going to take a lot of work in advance to make sure that you do the fundraising and get the endorsements that you need to even be in the running effectively. Um, so it, it, it's, to be honest, on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would say get a campaign committee together, assess uh, your strengths, your weaknesses, the threats, the opportunities, right? Do that, do that assessment and then determine your timeline and what your needs are. Um, and, and so it's, it's ultimately on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, great. So I'm just really quickly, uh, first of all, thank you, Adam. And thank you.
reminders about what the Democratic Party can offer you. And the first thing I'm going to say really clearly is that you must be a registered Democrat in Monterey County for us to endorse you, regardless of how wonderful you are. Regardless, we might support everything you stand for, but if you determine that you know, you're an independent or no party preference, or maybe you're a Republican uh, and you don't want to switch parties, then we cannot offer you our endorsement. Um, but if you are a registered Democrat, then we do encourage you to request the endorsement. It's a, a procedure. There's question, a questionnaire. We ask that you, uh, you know, state your qualifications and your alignment with the Democratic Party and with our local party. And then we have a process of committee, an endorsement committee, that goes through all of those applications and vets the folks and makes sure that you know, you are in alignment, then it goes to the Central Committee as a whole, and we vote on those endorsements. Oftentimes, we, the committee comes with recommendations, and you, generally those recommendations are followed, but not always. Um, it's, I don't know the timeline yet of when we're going to be doing that, but that's something for you to watch for. And we generally reach out to anybody that's running for office that we know is a Democrat, because we would like you know, as many people as possible. And um, we, there's so many offices this time, I don't know how it will work as far as people coming forward to the committee and making a pitch for support, because if we allowed everybody to do that, we'd probably be there for a week. And generally, we try to do it in one long night. So I don't know how that exactly is going to work, but the endorsement committee will most likely set the parameters. Um, but number one is that you are a registered Democrat. Now, some people who are registered Democrats but are running for nonpartisan seats, which most of the local offices are, or I guess I would say all of them are, um, decide, gee, you know, I don't, my neighbors are mostly Republicans and I know they're going to vote for me, but if they find out I'm endorsed by the Democratic Party, maybe they won't. But that's a personal choice you have to make. Um, you have to decide what's more important. If we have more time, maybe a candidate could, or an elected officer could um, speak to that. So that's one thing that we offer you as Democrats. Um, and then the use of the headquarters. Again, there's so many offices open, we're probably going to have to really negotiate how that works. But it is, it's a nice centrally located office in Seaside. And you would be um, you know, able, we have a Google Calendar, you can check to see if it's available, and then do phone banking from there, um, put together mailers, put together the door hangers, and so on. Um, if you do receive our endorsement, Polly was talking about it, the United campaign in the past, and I don't know, you know, the committee, we have to evaluate our funds to see what we can pay for, but in the past we've done two different kinds of mailers and two different drops. Um, Adam was alluding to the folks that are vote by mail. So those are our priority before the drop of the vote by mail ballots. Um, we get those in the mail and as much as possible, if we're going to do door hangers, we try and do door hangers for those folks. Then the focus after that is on the people who are poll voters, meaning they vote in polls. And so that way it kind of divides up your work. And if we do endorse you, you will be on our whatever it is we end up with, whether it's a door hanger or a mailer or a combination of those two, um, you know, and we're happy to, if we do door drops, then we will include your personal mail. We'll ask you, in turn, if you're walking precincts, to include our mailer with whatever, or our door hanger with your door hanger. So it's a, it's a mutual thing. And then we do ask for money. Correct, Polly? Um, not a lot. Is, it, is there a set amount for candidates, Holly, or do you know? It, it's by, it's by uh, area. So uh, assembly, we've been asked an assembly person for more. If it's school board, I think it's a minimal amount, and we'll accept whatever you can contribute to. Yeah. And that gets your name out pretty, and a lot of people use those um, mailers or those door hangers as kind of their guide, because they trust us as the Democratic Party, and you know, they are in, they, they can see who the other candidates are in and see, gee, if the Democratic Party's in alignment with those folks, and so we, we would be as well. Um, so, yes, quick question. Sorry. That's okay. So here, the, the, the 
I've been developing myself as a writing for a nonpartisan uh, position, and I am not committed to seek a potential endorsement. Are there any other mentoring opportunities with the Democratic Committee that would help mentor a new person? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm going to ask folks, if they can, in a moment, to take out your cell phones, because I don't have this particular link on my printed material. But um, one thing we're talking about doing is we would like to hold a, some follow-up workshops, but that would be much more uh, narrowly focused. So perhaps Adam and maybe Holly would join forces and present on running a campaign and finances. Uh, we've got some experts at communication. And so what we would request for that is that you fill out this survey that I'm going to give you the link for and that you identify yourself as a Democrat, and we will vet folks. Um, but this would be before we gave an endorsement. So anybody who's a Democrat, a registered Democrat in Monterey County, and you're pretty sure you're going to run, or maybe you're still thinking about it, we will notify you of these opportunities that will be coming up after the first of the year. We don't have dates yet. We'll try and get them. And you folks will be the first to hear about it because you're here. And um, we may use this location. We may end up using the Democratic headquarters if it's a smaller group. We've even talked about possibly doing some in Salinas and some on the peninsula. It, that will kind of depend on the interest that there is. And obviously, we'll get the word out, a, a bigger word. But that one, this one didn't require you to be, to even tell us what party you're in. We, don't, we just wanted folks to come and think about running for office. So for those follow-up ones, it wouldn't necessarily mean that we end up endorsing you or that you have to ask for our endorsement. But we would, since we're going to be maybe sharing some deep, dark secrets that we use, um, you know, we'd like you to at least be a Democrat in your thinking and your own personal registration. So, great question. And so, okay. can, can I just ask, yes. Uh, yes. if you don't have to be from Monterey County, right? I mean, to be invited to the follow-up session. Oh, well, as long as you're a Democrat, could you be from Santa? Um, I guess so. We, yeah, we, I mean, because we collaborated with the, the yeah, Santa Cruz um, Central Committee, so I'm sure we could work. That would be fine. Yeah, yeah. Great. Are you here from Santa Cruz? Yes. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful. So um, if people have their cell phones or if you just want to write this down, this is a survey about today, but it's also a survey of interest for the future, and your participation will really help us determine that. And I will also send this link via email to everybody who signed up so there I know a few people left a little early and even to the folks who signed up but didn't make it but if you can put it in today and get it going that would be terrific so the web address is um, http colon slash slash and then it's Monterey Dems all one word dot org slash winning dash ways dash survey and I am certain that that link is probably already on our Monterey Dems website but we just got that created yesterday and so just in case it's not so any last questions comments advice words of wisdom oh yes how do you, you make your, your phone calls, your fundraising phone calls, how do you convert a phone call into an actual received donation? Because you can't speak into a bank. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, in that scenario, you know, once you've secured their pledge for a donation, um, then traditionally you would arrange to have them mail a check. Um, but uh, increasingly what donors appreciate is if you have an online option as well. A lot of online donation portals for political causes do take a cut, like uh, the service Active Blue was mentioned before, and I've mentioned the service CrowdPack. Um, those are online services that can accept donations on your behalf, and then I think they take about a 3.5 or 4% cut. So um, that's unfortunate to lose out on that money, but it's an expected convenience on behalf of many donors. Um, but plenty of builders will still cut you a check and send it to you in the mail. Do you, as a follow-up to that, do you, have you had any experience um, in your campaigns with people using things like Venmo or Square Cash or anything like that? Um, not 
so far, and uh, I'm glad you bring that up because I would love to see that happen because that would really simplify things and streamline the donation process. My concern is that you have to collect certain data from a donor. Uh, and right now, things like Squarespace and Venmo just don't have that functionality, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, so it'd be great if that could happen, if, there, if the Venmo for campaigns popped up, that'd be awesome. Um, but uh, at this time, it's challenging because what you don't want to do is accept money from somebody and then not have the necessary information to report that donation accurately. And then you get in trouble for, you know, oh, it was just a $20 donation, but the FPPC is still going to get on your case about not knowing, you know, the, that donor's information. So that'd be the one copy on our issue. Okay. And that's exactly the kind of topic that we would cover if we did, uh, you know, an intensive finance with Holly and, you know, somebody else and then end up, you know, so that's really good. In, in theory, and if you, sorry, if you did know the donor information, and then you could technically accept that. Um, I've just never explored the reporting requirements or, or anything like that for that. But I, it's just another means of transferring funds. So as long as you can still do your reporting after. Okay. So um, Natalia and I are going to practice what uh, Adam was talking about in requesting donations. And, and that is that we're working for a better future for our community. And that's what the Democratic Central Committee is all about. And we can't be here without your support. And um, so to help us get started in fundraising, we have this little basket. And if you can't do it now, where you know you can go online to our website and there are ways to uh, donate. The best way, as Alan mentioned, was our gala dinner, and the information is out front. I just wanted to quickly mention I put together, or we put together a reading list. Um, and also some links to websites. Some of them are books that you actually have to buy, but the last two are both PDFs that you can download for free, and they're great. There's a couple articles about different websites, and then maybe the most important are the local contacts. I did print this um, calendar, but it's for statewide elections. That they don't, the I think they don't maybe have the up-to-date calendar for the new the local offices. But our Monterey County Elections Office are wonderful. They'll, they answer the phone, they'll talk to you, they want to help you. And so there's some links on the second page to the Monterey County um, Elections Office. There's also some legal resources. Adam was mentioning the Fair Political Practices, so there's links to that. So you can have the paper copy, and I will also send this document to everybody who's here and everybody who signed up, and then that way you can just you know do it electronically as well. And then um, I just Natalia wanted to gave a, a document that was important as well. Oh yeah, the open seats that are available and or vacant through not just in our county, right? There were some that were in Santa Cruz as well. We didn't print the Santa Cruz. Oh, we didn't print the Santa Cruz. But there were some, but, in, there. Were there some in there. Okay. And I just wanted to to clarify and add to what Elena said that your donation today makes events like this possible. We have to cover the cost for refreshments. We have to cover the cost for renting spaces out. Um, and these mailers, the door knockers, and the information guides are so helpful in, in guiding and coaching people about candidates. When I was a newbie to Seaside, and it was right around election time, that uh, information guide helped me a lot when I was looking at candidates um, for voting. That stuff doesn't come for free, so thank you so much for what you contributed today. And if you'd like to continue to contribute to the cause, there's a button available on the MC Dems website, correct? Yeah, correct. correct. And good. I want to thank the Carpenters Union and Sean in particular for <laughs> wonderful space and um, we were able to negotiate an in-kind donation so um, that helps both us and the Carpenters Union and so thank you for the setup and we promise we'll get out here quickly because I think you have another event happening. Yeah. I'm not even sure. <laughs> okay. 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 And thank, you, um, thank you Wes for yeah. filming and Ryan and all the committee members yeah. and thank you all. Give yourselves a hand and run for office.